privilege it is to know you, to serve you, to follow you, and Lord, now to come and worship you through your word. Father, we've worshiped you in giving, we've worshiped you in song, in study, we've worshiped you through story, in prayer, and now, Father, we want to worship you through your word. And Lord, I know that no one has come to hear me. They want to hear you. They need to hear a message from you. They need to hear meat in due season, as it were. And so, Father, I pray that you might fill me with your spirit, that you might anoint me with a coal from the proverbial altar. And Lord, that you might give me the words to speak, help me to know when to be quiet. And Father, please bless my brothers and sisters. I know many of them probably are tired from a long week of work. Maybe they're tired from the exhaustion of just living the trials of life. But Father, just now send your spirit to invigorate us. Do not allow the enemy to come along and rob us of the blessing of worship through the word. Father, as we celebrate this high Sabbath of baptisms, Lord, now we want the crowning act to be your word to bless us. Not because I present it, because you've promised your word will not return unto you void. So, Father, send forth your word just now. May we be drawn closer to you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as I am thinking about today's message, and let me get this thing back where it lets me control it. Here we go. I want you to think about, I like to ask questions. And so, as I ask questions, please give me some feedback. Please don't sit there and just, uh, I don't, I'm not looking to talk to the frozen chosen today. I want to talk to God's people, amen? amen? So as you think about this question, with what can we compare our walk with God? What would be a good metaphor, a good illustration, a good comparison? I've spent a lot of time thinking about this particular question. Because as I think about having a relationship with God, not all of us see it the same way. And we need examples well, how do I have a relationship, get this, with someone I can't see? How do I have a relationship with someone that if I talk to them, I don't hear them talk back to me? How do I do that? Well, one of the examples that came to mind for me is that some people have compared our relationship to God with marriage. Now, whether you are married in this world or you are single doesn't matter because you could still be married to Jesus, amen? Amen. I'm going to break that down. We're going to explore that from Scripture. But how does it hold up, this, this metaphor, this analogy of our relationship with God being like a marriage? Well, let's just travel back just a little bit, right? We remember, was marriage God's idea or was marriage man's idea? It's God's idea. I didn't come up with it. Now, I'm very thankful for it. I praise God that the Lord led me to discover my ginger in the ninth grade. That's the truth. And it's just, I'm living proof that God has mercy on fools and orphans. And I'm not an orphan. God has mercy on us. I met my wife in the ninth grade. No, we didn't marry in the ninth grade. We waited a few minutes. We waited a few minutes. We got out of school, but I, I, I met my ginger in the ninth grade. We got married two years after high school. She had finished a, an associate's in business. And I'm so thankful that in June we'll be celebrating 28 years of marriage. And I'm going to tell you, friends, if we were Catholic, she would be a saint twice over. <laughs> Living with this brother. But I'm blessed. It's, I'm blessed with God's idea. Now, I, I, I recognize sometimes things happen and sometimes divorce can come a part of that picture. And I also recognize this. There are a lot of people who would like to take God's idea of marriage and they'd like to mangle it all up. But saints, I'm here to tell you, the Bible hasn't changed. God's definition of marriage has not changed. And I'm not here to beat anybody up. I'm not here to put anybody down. Listen, we as God's people need to love everybody where we find them. But it does not mean in loving everybody that we endorse everything the world throws at us. You and I have to find a way, and here's the delicate balance. We have to find a way to both uphold the word of God and love those who are struggling to find themselves in harmony with the word of God. But I'll tell you, God's idea of marriage has not changed. 
he still intends for it to be between one man and one woman. As I think about this metaphor holding up, I believe it holds up very well, but does this metaphor have a biblical basis? So now what I'd like to do is just share a verse with you, and this is 2 Corinthians 11 2. Of course, Paul writing his second epistle to the church in Corinth, he says, for I am what? I'm jealous for you. But I love how he qualifies it. Well, time out, unless you think it's all about me, what type of jealousy is it? It's a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to how many husbands? To one husband, so that Christ, to Christ I might present you in what fashion, friends? A pure virgin. To those of you who are single, who have not been married, that may be here in a state of virginity, May I encourage you to remain in that state of virginity until such time as you enter into a marriage covenant. The world would look at you and say, wait a minute, you're some sort of weirdo if you want to be a virgin. If you want to save yourself to marriage, please do yourself a major favor. Save yourself for marriage. Save yourself for marriage. And it doesn't mean that if we've made some mistakes that God can't refresh us, that he can't restore us. But if God doesn't have to restore me and I just maintain that virgin purity, isn't that also a blessing? So if you're not married, if you're not in that state where you've given yourself in marriage and you still have your virginity, hang on to it. There's a reason God wants us to have that purity that we might experience the greatest depth of his blessings. And Paul now is using this metaphor, this beautiful metaphor of marriage to say, listen, when I introduced you to Jesus, I wanted him to be the only spouse in your life, spiritually speaking. Are you with me? I don't want anybody else coming in and muddying up the marriage bed, as it were, spiritually. I want when you come to Jesus, nobody else has a hook in your heart. I want you to be pure before God. So we see this metaphor having a little bit of a biblical basis, but let's look at a typical set of marriage vows. Now, I just want to be clear that as I go through these vows, those of you that may be dated, I am not marrying you, okay? Go through the process, just watch the vows though. Notice this, this and, and I actually have a Word document when I do premarital counseling that I've discovered different types of marriage vows. I share them with people. Here's, here's one that's on that list. And I just, Jack and Jill, why not, right? I, Jill, take you, Jack, to be my husband, my partner in life and my one true love. I will cherish our union and love you more each day than I did the day before. Isn't this just beautiful so far? You can just see her eyes glistening, face just aglow and love as she's saying these vows. I will trust you and respect you, laugh with you and cry with you, loving you faithfully through good times and bad, regardless of the obstacles we may face together. I give you my hand, my heart, and my love from this day forward as long as we both shall live. That's fairly, that's, that's fairly deep, right? It's, it's, it's got some meaning behind it. There's commitment there. I'm going to stand with you. Now, if I take these vows and, and, and spiritualize them, right? If I now apply them to 2 Corinthians that we just read, I can take Jill's name out of the way and I can put my name in there. And I'm not going to make my vow this time spiritually to my ginger, but I'm going to make my vow to my Jesus. I'm not going to take the time to go back and reread the whole thing, but I wonder, when you and I make our vows to Jesus, today we saw our baptismal candidates and our lady who made her profession of faith, we saw them stand up publicly and basically affirming the vows that the pastor read, yes or no? A vow is a sacred promise. They made a sacred promise. Have you and I been living out the sacred promise to Jesus that we made on the day of our baptism? Sometimes we forget those words. And, I, and, and I'm going to make a confession here. I know we're not Catholic. Ginger's looking at me like, what is he about to say? I was so nervous the day of my wedding that I don't remember the whole thing. <laughs> I, I'm just being honest with you. I was so excited. I was so happy. 
I was so nervous. My, my stomach was all tore up, you know. I was shaking, but I was excited and just, oh man, I was praising God. And I remember being at the service. But I don't remember everything that happened at the service. I'll give you an example. Somebody chose to bring a baby to my wedding. And apparently that baby's skin was being slowly peeled off during the whole service. Because that baby just scream cried the whole service. How many of you think I heard the baby? I didn't hear the baby. I couldn't have told you if somebody said, did you hear the baby? What baby? Because there was only one baby I was looking at. I was looking at my baby. My baby also wanted turtle doves at our wedding. They're over there in a cage and they were real turtle doves and they're sitting over there doing whatever they're doing, you know, the whole time. I had people tell me afterwards, listen, those birds were cute, but they drove me crazy. Guess what I heard? Nothing. I was just zoned in on my ginger. All that mattered was my commitment to her. And of course, when I go back and watch the wedding video, I heard the baby screaming the whole time. But people stayed for the wedding, praise God. Well, it's because we were feeding them afterwards, I figured that out. But think about it. Do you live, do you remember the vows you made to your Jesus? How often do you reflect upon those commitments? How often do you reflect upon your marital commitment? And I love to tell new couples when, 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 when I'm, I'm doing premarital counseling with them, I love to tell them, listen, one day all of the, 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 the lust is going to wear off and you're going to wake up one day with a marriage. One day all the makeup's going to be washed off and you're going to wake up and realize that when your spouse wakes up, their breath is measured in inches. You know what I'm talking about. That's when you have to make a decision to live by the vows. You're no longer driven by emotion. Are you with me, saints? How many of you are fresh in that commitment with Jesus? That you relive it, you think about it. I want to go through just some of these elements from the vows. It talks about my partner and my one true love. Do you remember Jesus' address to the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2 where he says, you're doing these things, but I have one thing against you that you have forgotten. You have left your what? Your first love. You see, friends, Jesus himself remembers this marriage metaphor. He remembers this commitment metaphor, and he says, you will not be successful in your spiritual walk unless I'm first. It's not going to happen. Your career can't be first, your money can't be first, your earthly spouse can't be first, your children can't be first. I have to be first, Jesus says, or else you will not have the success spiritually that you want. The next element of the vows talks about a cherishing of the union. The title of today's sermon is No Other Gods. Does God want us to put him first and not have any other gods in the picture? You better believe it. He wants us to be chaste with him, loving more and more each day. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi that I hope that your love will abound more and more as time goes on, that it will be something that builds. There was an old man who was interviewed one time after 68 years of marriage. 68 years of marriage. Anybody in here been married over 60 years? Not seeing any hands. Anybody over 40 years? Over 40? How many years, my friend? 42. Is that correct, ma'am? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, brother. I, I, had, I had to... This married man married 68 years. And they asked him, they said, what does it feel like to be married 68 years? And the man kind of looked off, kind of had that faraway look in his eyes, and he said, you know... 68 years has just felt like five minutes underwater. <laughs> Had his love been growing more and more, or was he simply tolerating the relationship? Friends, God is not asking us to tolerate the relationship. 
He wants us to grow in love. And the only way that love grows is with work, especially in an earthly marriage. Because I'm here to tell you, Ginger did not marry a perfect man, but nor did I marry a perfect woman. Right? We all have flaws, but aren't you glad spiritually that when we marry our Jesus, he is perfect. <laughs> he has no flaws. He is the one that will always be faithful. And so my love for him can grow more and more every day. What about trust and respect? I love reading in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. A lot of men love to take their wives there to verse 22 where it says, Wives, submit to your husband. Oh, and they love to beat their chests and, and, you know, and they forget to read verse 1 where it says that Christ gave himself for the church. So let me ask you this, ladies. Which one of you would have a hard time submitting to a man who lives sacrificially to love and serve you? That's a very different picture, isn't it? That whole submit to me, wives submit unto your husband. Many of us men take that, I'm going to lord over my wife. That's not what God's called you to do. God has called us as husbands to love our wives sacrificially. That's why when you get to the end of Ephesians chapter 5, it talks about, and the husband, in the very next verse, verse or three verses down, verse 25, it says, husbands, love your wives. The women aren't even commanded to love us so that when, so when she does love me, that's a bonus. I mean, listen, what did we just read in the Sabbath school lesson? Isaac needed a wife. Had she met him when she agreed to go be his wife? No, she moved out of the command of God and out of that desire to respect, and eventually she grew to love him. But you and I as husbands, gentlemen, are commanded to love our wives. That trust and respect, that's what the ladies are told. Ladies. Women, wives, respect your husbands. And here's what's interesting. It has taken decades of psychological studies to determine that by and large, not every case, but by and large, sociologists will tell us that women want to be loved and men want to be respected. God had it figured out before the sociologists ever got their hands on it. I'm glad I serve the God of heaven. How about you? Amen. Another aspect of the vows sharing all of life together. Did not God promise us in Deuteronomy 31 that he would never leave us nor forsake us? What did Jesus say in the Great Commission? Lo, I am with you how long? Always for even to the end of the age. God will never leave us. We get to share all of life with our Jesus, faithfully loving in all circumstances. Another element from the vows that we read. Again, it holds up in Scripture. Deuteronomy 6, 5. Jesus quoted this in Matthew 22. The Pharisees asked him, well, what's, what's the greatest commandment? What did Jesus say? That you love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, and spirit. Right? Every part of you, God is calling us to do that. The last part of the vows, complete surrender of the body throughout life. I've done some marriage counseling with couples in the past where they were struggling to find reasons to keep going. And sometimes when the marriage is falling apart, we use sex as a tool to barter. It happens. It's not what God has asked us to do. He's told us to be faithful, to surrender to one another. Likewise, in our relationship with God, your body does not belong to you for those of us who profess to be Christians. Now, <laughs> I'm not here to try to fall into the political realm. In fact, people try to corner me sometimes and they'll say, well, pastor, are you Democrat or Republican? Well, don't curse me either way. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't see either political party re fully representing what I believe in. Do you? Can you honestly say that there's a political party that fully represents your views from Scripture and on how God has showed us to approach life? There are things I can see on both parties that, hey, this, this might be a good idea, this might be a good idea. Why can't we just pull those things apart and do what's best for the country? <laughs> How's that for a novel idea? But one of the things raging in the national debate right now is whether or not you and I own our bodies. Have you been paying attention? Do you know what I'm talking about? 
Well, friends, if you and I are Christians, do I own my body? According to Scripture, <laughs> Paul asks the question, he says, Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that you are not your own? It's a question. He, says, goes, he goes on to say in verse 20, You are bought with a price. What was the price? <laughs> Any, anybody remember the price? Jesus on Calvary paid the price. He says, therefore, glorify God in your body. So saints, let's not get embroiled in the national debate and forget what scripture has told us. Amen. And when it comes to your relationship with God, remember, surrender of the body is also his domain. That's a lesson that I had to take to heart. When I left basic training, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Graduated basic training July 1st of 2005. That was on a Friday. The following Sunday, just right after, I was at AIT. For those of you who have not been in the Army, it's advanced individual training. I went right down the street, literally, <laughs> from where I did my basic training. Went down to AIT for 56 Mike, chaplain assistant school. Did all the training there for seven weeks to become MOS qualified. When I left basic training, when I left AIT, I weighed 175. I quickly left 175 in the rearview mirror. And when I got out of the Army, I was honorably discharged. Got out of the Army, didn't keep doing the PT, didn't keep up with things. And as of January this year, I weighed 313 pounds. Nobody that stands five foot seven should weigh 300 pounds if you can prevent it. So Ginger and I said, we need to do something about it. If, I, if God truly owns my body, if I'm going to glorify God in my body, should I be concerned about how I treat my body? So Ginger and I decided to work with a health coach. Sometimes you need somebody to tell you things you don't know, amen? And so we needed somebody to help us. So we've been following our health coach. We've been following her advice. We've been following her counsel. And do you know, yesterday morning, I was down 56.2 pounds. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Back in January, when I put on this suit, this button was dangerous. <laughs> it was dangerous, Miss Sonia. Sonia, right? Now, this morning, Miss Sonia is not in any danger. But it's not about me, saints. It's about God having mercy on a fool that didn't take care of himself and saying, I'm going to help you if you'll ask me for help. Yeah. Does God own your body? Yes. So when you make your commitment to him, let him have it all. Does not he who created us know more what I need than me who just tries to manage it? He who knelt down and lovingly formed me out of the dust of the earth. Doesn't he have a little better understanding of how all this works? I think so. Now granted, how you might reach your health goals might be different than how I've done it. I try not to get in the business of being the standard for you. I try not to get in the business of being the standard for somebody else or looking at somebody else and say, oh, well, they must not care. Listen, I'm not here to judge you or put you down. I'm simply here to tell you if you're tired of having the body that you have and you don't somehow have some sort of medical condition that makes you have that body, ask God to help you do something about it. God can help you, saints. Why? Because in our commitment to him, in our relationship to him, he wants us. What did Jesus say through John? Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in what type of health? Good health. In January, my blood pressure was 155 over 102. It, my button wasn't the only thing in danger of bursting. Last week, my blood pressure was 116 over 66. It's just in a few months. And saints, it's, and I say that glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for having mercy on me. Me a sinner, me a fool. Lord, help me. 
And saints, when you cry out that prayer, Jesus will help you. He cares about how we live. So I ask you this question. We've talked about these vows. We've established from Scripture that these commitments to God have a biblical foundation. But at some time in Scripture, did or does God ask us to marry him? Has, has he used this language or was it simply a metaphor that Paul borrowed for himself? Well, again, let's dig into Scripture and find out. We go back to Exodus 20 and verse 3. You guys remember this, right? This is where we find one presentation of the Ten Commandments. He says, you shall have how many other gods before me? No, no other gods. Does that sound like a, a marriage proposal? To a degree, right? He might not be saying, Do you, are you marrying me? But he's saying, if you're going to accept me, you're not going to have anybody else. The day that Ginger and I made our marital vows, were we essentially saying, you shall have no other men before me? Was she essentially saying to me, you shall have no other women before me? Right? I mean, so when we look at it in those terms, essentially God is saying, I want to be connected to you in the most intimate way. I want to be yours and I want you to be mine. And not because I just want to cloister you away from the world and make you miserable. Saints, God wants us to have that commitment to him because he wants to bring us joy. You remember the fruits of the Spirit, right? Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Do you remember one of the fruits of the Spirit being joy? Have you ever met some Christians who ha haven't quite made it to that fruit? How are you doing today? I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. Mercy. I'm not here to judge anybody, but a little fruit inspection wouldn't hurt over on that end, right? You know what I mean? Saints, do you have joy? Or is your Christian experience a drudgery? Is your Christian experience miserable? I promise I'm not going to give all these illustrations for the army just because I'm in Fayetteville. But I am going to tell you one more. We were finishing up our final march in basic training. We've been out in the field seven days and started getting dark. And the drill sergeants told us it's time to break camp. We load up all of our stuff and we start marching back and I had been selected as the platoon guide for basic training. So I was kind of the guy that was over the platoon with the drill. If there was a problem with the platoon, the first person the drill sergeant was going to come to was me. But another thing that had to happen is as we're marching back and we're using what's known as a ranger column, it's where we're on each side of the road, one soldier here, one staggered here, kind of in a, a Z pattern, right? And one of the things I had to do was kind of walk up and down the column of soldiers, making sure people maintain their spacing. So as the platoon's walking back, I get to do the walk, the march, essentially twice because I'm having to march up and down the column. We come to this one hill. We're towards the end, we believe. We've been marching for a long time. We've got our pack on. Of course, we're in our boots field uniform that smelled amazing after being in the field for a week. And I remember coming up this hill and I knew that if I stood up straight to march up this hill that I would fall backwards. I was at that point of exhaustion. And so I remember to make it up that hill I had to lean over to just balance the pack and I'm just saying, Lord, yes, I prayed. I went in as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian in the army. I said, Lord, help me. And God got me up that hill. And friends, if God is calling us to serve him, he's going to get us up the hills. And when we got over the hill, we saw this bonfire. And we got over there, we grounded our gear, they lined us up, and we had finished the final stage of our training and for the first time in our training, our drill sergeants talked to us like human beings. They came by and they put this little pin on our uniforms, basically signifying we had completed phase three and finally accepted us as soldiers. I love that my God accepts me before I complete my training. My God accepts me even he knows I can't complete the training without him. I can't do it on my own. He knows that he will have to do it for me. 
And, and, he, and he calls me to only serve him because of the first verse. Now, this ties back into part one of this sermon series. You can go and watch that sermon about a mighty deliverance. But God says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Because I'm that God who has delivered you, I'm also the God now calling you to have nobody else in your life. He has the right to ask for your allegiance. He has the right to ask for our loyalty. And he had to say, don't worship other gods, because they were doing that. You said, no, wait a minute, Pastor. These were God's people. They were the ones that were spared during the plagues. Doesn't mean that they didn't carry Egypt out of Egypt with them. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, Israelites had just been rescued. They were exposed to many false gods. Some of them, no doubt, had worshipped these false gods. And I know this because as I read about the Sinai experience, as God is up there giving these tablets of stone to Moses, what's happening down the hill? <laughs> and, and, and I love Aaron's response. Have you read Aaron's response lately? Check this out. Exodus 32, verse 24 Moses is saying, what's going on? I said to them, this is Aaron, he says, I said to them, the rest of the people that you left me with, whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. So they gave it to me. I threw it into the fire and out popped this calf. <laughs> it's a miracle. I don't know how it happened. I just, uh, out popped this calf. It's the most ridiculous answer. Saints, if you and I gave that answer to our employer about something, you would be fired. Listen, I don't know what happened. I was just standing here and all of a sudden the, 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 these goods disappeared. No, you stole them. They're in your car. I didn't do it. I just opened the trunk and they were there. You and I would go to jail. Aaron gives this ridiculous response, so we know that they were worshiping idols. Maybe not completely, maybe they were doing some sort of hybrid, maybe they were doing some sort of thing where they were merging religions together, but we know it was something that they needed to be reminded, listen, if you're going to serve the God of heaven, it's him first, it's him alone. They had to have that reminder. So this first commandment fits perfectly, I believe, with a marriage metaphor. You'll have no other gods before me. God wants to be first before all others in our lives. This means, now catch this please, this means before your earthly spouse. As much as I have publicly confessed my love for my ginger, Jesus has to be more important than ginger. And if she's not second to Jesus, then I'm messed up. Question for you, in the Garden of Eden, was Jesus before Eve? Apparently not. If Jesus had been first, if God had been first, you and I would probably be living in a different world right now. I don't know what that would look like, but I do know if Adam had remained faithful, God would have somehow figured it out differently. He already had a plan, but he chose Eve over God. Your children. I have seen a number of families that fall apart after the kids get raised and move out. Saints, pay attention, please. Those of you that are raising children, that you don't want to lose your marriage when your kids move out, make sure that you keep building your marriage relationship as you raise your kids. The kids are important. But the kids cannot supplant your relationship between your husband and your wife. I saw it happen being part of the unit ministry team when we were deployed to Iraq. Soldiers sometimes got it in their minds that, hey, family's back here in the States. I'm over here in Iraq. When I left my family, their life just kind of stopped. No. While you're on mission, the family's life keeps moving forward. And we had soldiers who would not communicate with their families the whole deployment. And what they found out is when they got home, life was not back here where they left it. Life had moved on and they had not kept up with life. And when they come back, they have deep marital problems. We had one poor soldier came home on his leave. His wife had sold the house, had not told him 
and he showed up to a house that he used to live in that somebody else was living in. Crazy stuff happens. I took a cell phone to Iraq. I found an interpreter that would sell me an illegal SIM card. I'm out now, they can't touch me. <laughs> and we had Turkish vendors on our base. I was stationed at uh, Fob Diamondback up in Mosul and I bought prepaid minutes. I nearly went broke calling my wife. But when I came home and stepped off the plane, my life was at the same place that hers was because it was worth the investment to stay connected to my wife, to my kids. Saints, don't let your children, don't let your spouse get in the way of your relationship with God. Choose every day to stay connected to God. Don't let your extended family some of you, may not, I was not raised in the Adventist church. Anybody else not raised in the Adventist church? You came in from something else? I remember when I started looking at Adventism, my stepdad told me, he said, you're not really interested in God, you're just chasing that girl. How many of you have been told you were crazy for wanting to embrace the Sabbath? Don't let your extended, here's, here's what I love to tell young people. Don't let your friends take your crown of life and I would say to each of you, don't let your family take your crown. Your family can't give you the crown of life. Why would you give them the authority to take it from you? Don't let your career get in the way. God has to be first. He has to be of paramount importance. In closing, I want to share with you just a brief story. It's the story of Joshua. Joshua. You remember the story, right? He's the leader now after Moses. He's told to go and take the cities. And as you can see on the screen, the city of Jericho was in their sights. They were told to go and spy out this territory. And there was a lady there who ran a hotel. Is that what she did? <laughs> kind of, sort of, Bob tells me. Rahab. How is she forever immortalized in Scripture? Rahab the what? Rahab the harlot, the prostitute. Some have often questioned, why was it that the spies went there? I'm going to leave that with Pastor Marsden to explain in his next message or whenever he chooses. But I want to deal with the fact that this is a woman who was willing to hide the spies, yes or no? And you see in the one picture here, she's down there sending them off. And they had, she had the spies hiding up in the roof the whole time. I love this story because it tells me about the grace of God in the Old Testament. You see, some people will say, listen, I want to be a New Testament Christian because that God of the Old Testament, man, that's a vengeful guy. That's a vengeful dude. I don't want anything to do with him. Listen, what did Rahab say? She said, we have heard what your God has been doing when he took out these other nations. Our hearts melted. And essentially, Rahab is telling them, I've heard about your God. And what does she say to them? When you come back, please remember me. Rahab wanted more than the life in Jericho had been affording her. And do you know that because of that faithfulness, she was told to put a scarlet cord in the window she lowers the spies, she sends them on their way, and then when it comes to march around Jericho, they march the seven days, and you know on that final day, as they blow the trumpets, and what's the old story? And the walls came what? Tumbling down. But as the walls came tumbling down, notice how the picture shows that there was a segment of the wall that did not fall. It was the segment where hang the red cord. And Rahab, who was known as a harlot, not only was saved, not only was her family saved, but if you go to Matthew, the first chapter, Rahab ends up being in the lineage of Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you, God can take your worst and turn it into his best. If you and I are willing to say, as Joshua said, and, and I love, that's why I had in the scripture reading, I wanted you to read verse 13. He's reminding these people, God's given you something you didn't work for. God's given you something that you didn't plant. You've been eating food that you didn't raise. But hey, 
If it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, if it's evil in your sight, if you think it's foolishness to serve the God of heaven, then you do what you want to do. Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. But I love what he says. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So what does this teach us about the character of God? Well, I would say that God wants to be married to us today. He wants to be our one true love before all others. He wants us to be partners with him. He wants us to be faithful and not commit spiritual adultery. He wants us to trust him completely, saints. And as far as his character, it shows me that God is jealous for us. Not jealous in a narcissistic way, but in a way that he wants to preserve you for eternity. It teaches me that God wants to shower his blessings on us. He is the ultimate giver of good gifts. God wants to teach us what true love is all about. True love is not reflected on the internet. True love is not reflected in all of the various sites that would vie for your attention. True love is a love that sacrifices for others. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So I ask you my final question. To what are you married today? Are you married to your career? Are you married to your family? Are you married to sports? You know, there's a verse in the scripture that says, out of the abundance of the heart, what happens with the mouth? The mouth speaks. So if you want to know what your first love is, ask yourself, what do I spend my time talking about? Is that fair, yes or no? When you don't have to talk about work, when you don't have to talk about something that somebody's asking you a question, and you're just choosing to make conversation, what do you share? What comes out of your mouth? What are your first thoughts? What are your idle thoughts? As friend saints, that'll tell you. It tells me what's the first love in my heart. And today, while I affirm God's gift of marriage to us as men and women, I have to put Ginger second, and I want my Jesus to be first. How about you? Is there anybody that would like to make that commitment with me today, that you want to first and foremost be married to Jesus? Let me pray with you, please. Loving Father, thank you so much that you are in the business of saving foolish people. We look through Scripture, and over and over you saved those who did not deserve salvation. You worked, you labored with those who fought you at every opportunity. You continued to love and chase after those who turned their backs on you and worshiped false gods. But today, Father, we're making a commitment. We're saying that we want Jesus to be first, that we don't want any other gods whether that's the God of money, the God of career, the God of family, the God of sports, the God of whatever. Father, we want you to be first. So Lord, please rise to the top. Push aside all of those other relationships. May they become secondary, tertiary, or maybe some of them don't even need to exist anymore. Father, give us a fresh start today. Forgive us where we have fallen. Cleanse us from all sin. And Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Clothe us with the righteousness of Christ. And Father, I thank you. Thank you for having mercy on us today and choosing to put us first when Jesus hung on Calvary's cross. We thank you in his holy name. Amen.